Okay, so I go full screen. And here we are, share screen. Okay. Or maybe one question, how much, I mean, who, who is uh, listening? They're all from neutron star astrophysics or they're um, all, all kind of people? No, not all of them are familiar with neutron stars. Okay. Different specialities. So it is better to uh, yeah. discuss uh, things broadly. So, okay. uh, uh, may I introduce you and we will start then, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so good morning, Professor Pash, and uh, good evening, everyone. We will start a seminar today, and today we will have a lecture of Professor Pash on a Hyperburst in the Maxi G0556 neutron star, the evidence for a new type of thermonuclear explosion. So please, Danny, you're welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Dimar, and thank you very much for, for the invitation. I wish I could be there with you, and uh, but unfortunately, it's not possible now, but hopefully in the near future, travel will be easier and we could visit each other more often. So what I'm going to, to talk to you about today is uh, well, something we came out recently and was kind of a surprise, but it possibly solved a puzzle in neutron star astrophysics. So I'm going to, to go through this in some detail, I'm going to talk a little bit about neutron stars, and I'm going to talk about low mass X-ray binaries and accreting system. And I will describe how we think that the stars is getting heated during the accretion. Then we have many system in which accretion is transient. So we have long period in which there is no accretion, so we can directly see the neutron star itself and follow the response of the neutron star after the perturbation from the heating by the accretion. So this turned out to be absolutely fantastic system. Imagine neutron stars, basically the most, some of the most exotic system in the universe. And to have a process in which a neutron star is taken out of equilibrium, strongly perturbated, and then you can see how the star goes back to equilibrium. This is something which is really unique. There are very few system in universe when you can see the system perturbated and, and how it responds to the perturbation. So we have this opportunity in a, in a few system. And then, so, so we, we can learn things about the interior of neutron star that we could never learn by other ways. So let, let me go slowly, just describe briefly what our understanding or misunderstanding of what is a neutron star. So here I have a nice figure of St. Petersburg and here is a neutron star in St. Petersburg. It is on scale. So these stars are about 25 kilometers across. Now, in more detail, if you look at the structure of the star. Oh, one question. In my screen in the top, I see the zoom menu. Do you see it also? Oh. No, no. Everything is good. Okay, perfect, because it bothers me, so if you don't see it, it's good. Okay, so, so the star is about 12 to 14 kilometers in radius, and uh, as any star at the surface, we, we think there is an atmosphere. Particularly neutrons are that accrete matter from a companion, then definitely we have an atmosphere made of hydrogen and helium, which is a matter being accreted. The atmosphere, where, where the spectrum from the emerging radiation is formed. This is just a few centimeters thick because of the extremely high gravity. It's not thousands of kilometers, like, like in, in normal star or even kilometers in the case of Earth. It's just a few centimeters thick. 
Then below the atmosphere, we, we have a region where the matter is still quite soft and where they, the properties, the density and the pressure depend strongly on the temperature. So we call this regime the envelope. And this is something which is a few meters thick, maybe 50 to 100 meters at most. Then by increasing pressure, uh, the nuclei suddenly crystallized and we have what we call the crust, which basically it's, it's a solid layer, which can be a few hundred meters thick. Remember the total radius is like 12 kilometers. So we have at most, let's say one kilometers or half a kilometers of a solid matter. And then we reach a point where the nuclei touch each other. So we cannot distinguish one nucleus from the other. And we get an homogeneous matter made of neutrons and protons. And uh, with a very high fractions of neutrons, that's why finally it's called a neutron star, let's say 95% neutron and 5% proton. So it's like a quantum liquid of neutrons and protons. And if you go deeper into the star, then it increases and we may have some exotic form of matter. We may have hyperons or quark matter or God knows what. It's represented by this question mark here. So this question mark is a large part of the interest of studying this object because we have conditions of densities that are not reproducible in laboratory. And here I show in a little bit more detail the structure in the crust where you would see the nuclei, which we have no strong evidence, which actually come from the work of you people in this low mass X-ray binary and accreting system that the crust of the neutrons are really form a, not only a solid, it's a crystallized solid. So the nuclei are mostly on the lattice. Here I show a body center, a, yeah, cubic body centered lattice. But in most of the part of this crust, uh, they are not in the nuclei, there are also a lot of neutrons which are in between the nuclei. This neutron, we believe, form a superfluid. And uh, it's also somewhat demonstrated from this study I'm going to describe, and this also result from you guys, that uh, the neutron should be superfluid in a large part of this crust. So the funny structure of a crystallized nuclei immersed into a superfluid gas of neutrons. And since the, super, the star is rotating, a superfluid cannot rotate directly. It has to form vortices. So we have this funny structure of vortices like spaghetti parallel to the, so the rotation axis and which are immersed in this meeting is this medium of a rotating lattice. No? When you go to density, when you approach nuclear matter density, when the nuclei almost touch each other, then it turns out they, they become deformed and instead of being spherical nuclei, they become elongate, elongated. And you reach a point when you may have even one dimensional nuclei, they call spaghettis. Then increasing some of the density, the spaghetti and get closer and closer to each other. They can touch each other and fuse, and you would have like two-dimensional layer, nuclear layer, and they call the pass the what it called the what? No, there's a name the, the lasagna. Lasagna, yeah. <laughs> so, that, that, so the matter would be instead of having spherical, would be like rice. We, we get like lasagna, a sheet of dense matter of neutrons and proton. In between them, you still have a gas of super free neutrons and then another one. And when, when these lasagna sheets will compress them even more, they start touching each other. So you get a small region of low density in between the, the denser matter. And uh, this form bubbles. So sometimes this is called the Swiss cheese phase. And then this low den lower density phase disappear, and we are really in the core. So th this has been called the pasta phase. And it, it could be a large part of the crust, actually. Maybe half of the mass of the crust could be in this phase. And we would like to see some effect of this funny structure. Actually, it's quite difficult, but we still have hope that someday from this system we are studying, we, we could get some evidence that this fancy structure exists. And then we have the inner core. No? In the core, the neutron are super free, the proton will be superconducting, we have vortices, and then the magnetic field will be confined into magnetic flux tube. So even if it's some kind of homogeneous matter, it actually has kind of a very fancy and complicated structure. So this is the stuff that fascinates us and what we, we would like to understand. And uh, so now let me go to the next kind of system, these low mass X-ray binaries. 
So it's a binary system. Uh, there are two types of them in the gross classification, the high mass one, where the companion star, sorry, where the companion star is much more massive than accreting neutron star. So in some cases, accretion goes through an accretion disk and you see X-ray pulsation. This comes from the fact that the neutron star in this case still have a very strong magnetic field. Accreting matter is channeled by the magnetic field and fall in the magnetic poles. So when the star is rotating, you have like a beam of high energy radiation rotating like, like a, a lighthouse in a, in a harbor and we see the pulsation. The other kind of system are low mass X-ray binaries when the companion star is less massive than your neutron star. In, in most cases, it's like a half a solar mass main sequence star. In some extreme cases, it could even be a, a white dwarf. This is the closest system known, this 4U 1820 minus 30, where, where the neutrons are wide up, are separated just by 130,000 kilometers. So you can compare this with the size of the sun or even the, with the size of the earth. So the extremely compact system. So again, here, the accretion goes through an accretion disk. Matter goes in spiral until it falls into the surface of the neutron star. And then when the matter accretes, so you're transferring hydrogen and helium in all cases, because it's what the, the atmosphere of the companion star is made of. So you accumulate this hydrogen and helium at the surface. And sometimes the burning of hydrogen or helium become unstable. You get explosions, which have been known as X-ray bursts or type one X-ray bursts. So here's a typical example of what these bursts would look like. You have a bright explosion and then a cooling phase which lasts a few tens of seconds. Now, some bursts are longer. They are bursts that can last several minutes. And uh, in the 2000, a new class of bursts was described, which were called uh, super bursts. And with the cooling phase, instead of lasting like half a minute, can last up to half a day. And uh, now I'm going to argue that we actually have one case of an even much stronger burst, which I call a hyperburst, in which the cooling phase lasts not even days, but lasts several years. So now let's go. Uh, a nice figure which shows the galactic center observed during three months by the Rossi X-ray timing explorer. And each one of these bright spots is an X-ray binary. In some cases, a black hole accreting from the companion, and many cases are neutron stars. And you see many of them are transient source. No? Some are absolutely persistent. They never change. They accrete all the time at the same rate, but some of them turn on and off. So this uh, transient one, when they harbor neutron stars, will be this interesting one, which will allow us to observe the neutron star when the accretion stops. So here are three examples of this uh, kind of, of system. You can see here, uh, these are also observations from an old sky monitor. So th when it's zero, it's basically background, just noise. And then suddenly there's a short phase of accretion that lasts a few weeks. Uh, other systems are much more prolific. They have much more regular accretion phase. And uh, some of them are called quasi persistent because they can have accretion phase that last several years. And then they become quite sound for some time. So. So these are the systems that turn out to be very interesting because we could expect that after several years of accretion, the neutron star will be strongly perturbated by the accretion and we can get good observation of how the star recovers from it. So here is a, a famous example so that the system XTJ 1702 462. It, it had in uh, 2000, what is this? 2005, so 2006, it started accreting. The early phase was almost at Eddington or even above Eddington. The accretion lasted about two years and then suddenly the source disappeared. So these data are again from the old sky monitor on the Ross X ray timing explorer. So not very good data, but they are also to follow the evolution of the star every day. And then suddenly accretion dropped. And then people rang the, the, the alarm and decided, OK, it's getting interesting. We have to observe much more carefully. So they asked for a sequence of observation by Chandra and Newton. These are the time of the observation. So this allows to observe the cooling of the neutron star. So if you look more detail what's happening here, 
you have observation from the previous figure from the Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer, then their observation by SWIFT, which were target of opportunity during the, the last part of the cooling phase, and then the Chandra observation and the X, uh, XMM neutron observation. So here we see the end of the accretion phase, which even show an exponential decay, because this is log scale and linear. So suddenly the accretion decreases exponentially. So the interpretation is that the, the companion star is transferring matter very slowly. So it builds up an accretion disk very slowly. Suddenly that the disk, I mean, it built up a disk, which is not accreting. Suddenly the disk become unstable accretion start. It lasts for some time. In some cases, it lasts for a few weeks. In some cases, it lasts for a few years until the disk basically is empty on accretion stop. And it's quite, quite often we see an exponential phase at the end of the accretion. And, uh, and then suddenly you see something different, which has a completely different time behavior. And so the spectrum look different. And clearly here we are seeing the surface of the neutron star, a just clear neutron star with, in most cases, no or very, very little accretion. And here for the same system at six months of interval, you can clearly see from a company from the Chand first Chandra data and then X XMM Newton, we see clearly that the, the star is getting fainter and fainter with time. So we see an effect of the recovery of the neutron star from the perturbation. So now we can wonder, okay, what, what are the mechanisms that are generating heat inside the neutron star? So let's say, this, let me describe briefly the processing of the accreted matter. First, obviously, when matter fall onto the neutron star surface, it releases gravitational energy. Can estimate of something like GMM over R, where M is the mass of the particle, it's a proton falling onto the star. And uh, a simple estimate show you that it, uh, for, for typical value, uh, we, we find that the gravitational energy is about one quarter of the ma rest mass of, of the matter. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's an enormously strong source of energy. And um, now if you have an accretion disk, just by the Virial theorem, about 50% of this energy is released in the disk. And you have 50% of this left for when the star hits the surface, of, when the matter hits the surface of the neutron star. So it's still of the order of one to 200 MeBs per particle that are released at the surface. Now it turn out, turns out that the interior of the star will be hotter than the surface. Even though the surface is about 10 to 20 million Kelvin, the interior is hotter. So by the second law of thermodynamics, heat flows from the hot to cold and not the other way around. So the heat from the surface cannot go into the interior of the star. So all this gravitational energy is radiated at the surface. So it's bad in some sense because you have a huge source of energy and it's, it's not taken advantage of, of. It is a nice part on the other side because what is going to hit the neutron star is not gravitational energy, but it's going to be another form of energy. So we, we can study something which is not gravity by seeing how the neutron star is being heated. Now this matter accreted at the surface undergo nuclear reaction, hydrogen will fuse into helium in the layer, which is just a few meters six below the surface. So this release about seven MeV per nucleon. Then helium will fuse to carbon, which release about half an, half an MeV per nucleon. In many cases, burning can become unstable. So matter accumulate for a few hours or a few days or a few weeks, depending on the accretion rate. And then suddenly the, the nuclear burning become unstable. You get a gigantic thermonuclear explosion and that produces the X-ray burst. If you go deeper into the star, when matter is accreted from the X-ray burst and be processed into heavier element, so we can have reaction like electron captures because uh, the electron that immerse into this uh, dense matter, when being compressed, they have more and more energy and they can be captured in the nuclei. For example, you have an iron 56 captures and, and electrons and become magnesium 25, uh, 50, magnesium 56, so we have a, an early nucleus with 26 uh, proton 
then suddenly you find itself with only 25 protons. This nucleus is even is odd, odd. No? You have an odd number of neutrons and protons, so they weakly bond. So this nucleus will immediately capture a second electron and end up with a new nucleus, which is again an even number of neutrons and protons. That will be chromium 56. And so, so this energy, this reaction liberates some energy and they also emit neutrinos because of the conversion of a proton into neutrons. No? If density increases, we get nuclei that are so much neutron rich that uh, the new neutron don't, cannot be bound into the nucleus, so they, they start dripping and they reside outside of the nucleus. And uh, so, so this neutron emission also releases some energy. And deeper into the star, we reach a point when the, the electric charge of the nuclei becomes so small because they have captured many electrons. So for example, we could have a neon uh, 34 that contains uh, 24 neutrons, but be having a low electric charge, they can fuse, and these are called pycnonuclear fusion. It's in distinction with thermonuclear fusion, where in thermonuclear, because the high temperature, the Coulomb barrier can be overcome. And in pycnonuclear, it's not because the temperature is a high density, and it's a, the, the zero level motion of the nuclei that makes that sometimes they, have, that they get close to each other and fusion can occur. So of course, this is an extremely inefficient process, but with high density and having enough time, matter can undergo in this. And uh, here I have a list of more, more detailed reactions. This one is the first paper that described it and became very famous by Powell Hansel and Stunik in 1990. So you see the density at which each one of these uh, reactions occurs. And from that the first one estimated if you start with iron, you would iron gold go to chromium, and this will absorb two electrons. So they mark it at minus two. So actually, it's two electrons on that side that disappear no? and emit two neutrinos. Then chromium goes into titanium, absorbing two electrons, and then titanium to calcium, and then calcium to argon. And then the density of the other few times 10 to 11 grams per cubic centimeter, suddenly you have so many neutrons that your neutron can, cannot anymore be contained in the nuclei. So this is called the neutron trip point. So that's where we, ent we enter the inner crust of the neutron star when you have free neutron outside the nuclei. And the inner crust, you can go on more reactions like this of electron captures, which emit, neutrino, which emit neutrons, and then sometimes the pick nuclear reaction. So there is actually a very, very large sequence of possible reactions depending on what other nuclei you start from. They, they, in reality, calculation, there can, can probably be hundreds of such uh, electron captures and the neutron emission and a few big non-nuclear reactions. So this is from a later paper of Hansen and Stunik, which show you two, two possibilities for starting at low density, depending on how the burning occurred at the surface of the star. You may start with iron 56, or you may start with a palladium, which has a mass of 106. So depending on what the burning occurs at low density, you would have two different types of nuclei, but they have similar evolution. So you see, as you push it to higher densities, the number of neutrons increase, and here's the number of protons from the same nuclei, so they decrease. So each time you have a jump of two in uh, proton because you capture two electrons and the number of neutrons increase by two. And at some point, the, the use, you reach a neutron trip point, then the, the number of neutrons inside the nuclei decrease rapidly, and you have this uh, peak non-nuclear where suddenly the number of neutrons shown by factor two when you, you fuse two nuclei. So there are many models like this have been proposed. Here, and here you see for, the, for that same model, the energy source, every time you have an electron capture, you have an energy release. This is an MeV, so they're typically like 20 to 250 kV released by each electron captures. When you go deeper into cross, when you have the peak non-nuclear reactions, and then you, you release more energy. So it's a, the order of a few hundred MeV in each uh, peak non-nuclear fusions. And uh, the, the global energetic, so this is uh, the original hands and stunic model with only one single nucleus at low density. In that, that case, the one that started with palladium 106. And then also model proposed by Gupta and collaborators when they have a different mix of nuclei at low density. So this is a very fancy model with many, many nuclei. 
but globally, the, the total energy liberated is basically the same. Well, there's a difference of 20, 30 percent, but usually in astrophysics, 20, 30 percent is is uh, like high accuracy. So it, it looks like this model of all these electron captures and pignon nuclear reaction <coughs> seem to be quite robust, and it and it will liberate between one and a half and two MeV for each neutron and proton that have been accreted. So after they go through the nuclear burning at the surface, when they've been transformed into heavy nuclei during the X-ray burst or the reaction that occurs in the ocean at low density, when you push to high density until they reach the core of the star, in total, they will liberate between one and a half and two MeV. So in summary, the heating would be about 200 MeV liberated at the surface from the matter heating the surface of the neutron star with its kinetic energy. Then we have the nuclear fusion, thermonuclear burning in the ocean, in the liquid part. So this is just the first few meters below the surface. So it's the burning of hydrogen into helium, helium into carbon, and the carbon into heavy element possibly. This really is about five to seven MeV for each particle. Then we have the, this, this deep crustal heating, so the electron captures emission of neutron peak non-nuclear reaction. Which, which liberate between one and two MeV roughly. And if you look at the evolution of the star of a long time scale, then you also have to include the neutrino loss that can cool the star, but usually of time scale of a few hundred years. And this nuclear reaction that occurred deep in the crust will also allow us to heat up the core of the star. This heat from the crust will flow into the core and will be stored there. And again, in that case, the time scale are of centuries, two thousand of years. So that that's the panorama of what's happening from the heating. Now let let go and see the cooling of the star. So here we look now at a few sample of objects. We have about a dozen of cases when we can observe the cooling of the star when the accretion stops. So you, here the list of them of, of six objects. So you see when that the time after the end of the accretion or burst, or burst always mean accretion. An X-ray burst means a, term, a thermonuclear explosion. So that the time in days after the end of the accretion, and you see that the star can emerge with temperature of the order of one to 200 EVs. In this field, people like to measure temperature in electron volt. So 100 EV is one million Kelvin roughly. And in this six, six system, we see clearly on a time scale of a few years, the cooling of the crust. And uh, th this uh, continuous line is just an exponential fit. There is no physics into it. No? It's just to guide the eyes. So let me look at, at two or three uh, special cases. The first one that was studied, and it's also the first one that uh, stopped accretion that was in, 2000, in the year 2000 that it was uh, observed not to accrete anymore. And so that the, the first result I'm going to show you is presented from, from Peter Sterning and Dima Powell Hensel and, and Sasha Portehim. So that, that was absolutely fantastic result. Actually, I was pissed off that I didn't do it. I, I had everything to do this and I didn't have time to do it. And then they, they, they come with this paper and say, oh, I should have done that. But anyway, that was my punishment for being stupid and slow. And uh, they're actually fantastic result here because you see that the temperature of the star at the end of the accretion, accretion stop and the star start cooling and these are the data point. And uh, so the model that fit reasonably well, the cooling, and then they try what we, we change a little bit the physics. So the first issue what, was at that time, what, what is the crust, the, the state of the crust? It, it is solid, is it crystallized? Uh, or is it just an amorphous solid, no? Which is could look like it, it is crystallized, but the nuclei are not organized in the lattice. So if the, the matter is an amorphous instead of being crystallized, there's an enormous difference for the electrons. The thermal conductivity is due to the electron, the scattering of the electron in the lattice is much less efficient than the scattering electron in amorphous matter. So in amorphous, a lot of scattering and a very low thermal conductivity. So here's a good example. Let's say, well, just assume the matter is in a more full state with very low conductivity and see how the crust cool. And you can see it, it doesn't cool at all. 
So you deposit a lot of energy and it takes forever for the crust to cool. So this was actually a fantastic result because it, it gives us solid proof that the crust forms a crystal and it's not an amorphous solid. There's also an interesting case that they say, okay, we know we have a lot of nutrients in the inner crust and they expect it to be super fluid. What if they're not super fluid? When neutron become super fluid, they have a very low thermal, uh, very low specific heat. And so they cool much faster when they're super fluid than even not super fluid. And by turning off super fluidity, you see that the cooling is much slower. So this is also a good argument that the matter should, neutron should be super fluid in the inner crust. It is not as strong as the other one, okay? With low conductivity, it's a complete disaster. So there's no doubt about it. Superfluidity, I mean, maybe, maybe you could change the parameters and fit it without superfluidity. But, but still, it is a good case that we may have here evidence that neutrons are superfluid. Hmm? Now, th there's a paper which came out just after this, because if you look at this, it looks very well, but the first data point is not fit. It looks like the early cooling is too rapid to fit the first data point. You look at this and say, I mean, who cares? It's, it's within the error bars, it's not too bad. If you look a little bit more detail, it, it's kind of a trouble. So that was a, a next paper by Ed Brown and Andrew coming two years after. So they, to, to emphasize this early cooling phase, instead of using a linear scale, they, they use a log scale. So you, you can display the, the, the early part more carefully. So the what they do here, no? the log scale. And you, for the case of this KS uh, stars, you, you see the early data point. So, and you see the, the first data point, you, you don't get it. So you have to fudge the theory and add some extra source. They called it a shallow heating in distinction with the deep crustal heating. So they just put by hand some extra energy at low density. And, and then you can fit the first data point. Hmm? And actually, there was some argument when, when people model X-ray birth that they, it, it looked like there, there is some missing source of energy at low density. So they, they knew about it and they kind of like that we, it, it looked like we, we may need some extra energy, you know? I mean, it's not terribly robust. I mean, it, it's maybe, it's, this is one sigma error of ours, no? So if you don't add this extra energy, you would be like two or three sigma within the first data point. So, I mean, three sigma is not a disaster, no? But it's an indication that there is something missing in the theory. Hmm? So uh, that, that was the first indication. No? Let's see an, another case, MXB 1659. Okay, so that was the second source that uh, went into quiescence also in 2000. And uh, they show that uh, to, to get a good fit of this, you, you need the shallow heating also early on, but you cannot have a perfectly pure crystal. So the thermal conductivity is very high, but it's not extremely high. So you have to add something which is called impurity. Again, it's some kind of simple way to fudge the thermal conductivity and add some, some extra scattering which is somewhat similar to what we would have in a liquid. So let's say the temperature independent scattering source, where the scattering with, with the ion in the lattice is temperature dependent. And uh, so the impurity could, could be any kind of stuff happening in the crystal. It is not a perfect crystal. And it needs a small amount of impurity. So uh, it, it was also a surprise in that sense that the, the model of burning at low density would predict that there were a very wide range of nuclei. And people saw that even if it crystallized, it would be a very impure crystal. And it turned out that it's not, it's pretty pure. So the, there is something that, that uh, either separates the heavy nuclei from the light nuclei or something that's, that's wrong in the nuclear burning that people are being estimated. No? Now, the next step of what we did with then I started working on this with a group in Amsterdam. So we, when the first thing we did, that was part of the PhD of Laura Otis. So having collaboration directly with Observer was good because we had something more, more, much closer to the data. So I'll show you what we get here when we study the accretion, when instead of assuming you have constant accretion during the outburst, we will follow in detail the, the time evolution of the accretion rate. And it would, would have some importance 
when we follow the evolution of the neutron star just at the beginning of the cooling phase. So I'm going to show you uh, an animation here, small movie, so you will see that the age of the star is effective temperature. You will have an accretion phase of 12 years, so that for the system KS and something. Uh, so we will have constant accretion, so this is the star will heat up and with a constant surface temperature, then accretion stop and the cooling go down smoothly. And you will see here also the evolution of the temperature in the crust, so that the, the, tem the temperature profile inside the neutron star. No? So this uh, the outer boundary, a density of 10 to the 8. So at, at lower density, we have like a liquid matter, the ocean, which in this calculation is treated as an outer boundary condition. So this is the temperature inside the star, the order of 10 to the 8 Kelvin. Here we have the outer crust, so we have only a, a nuclei and electrons. In the inner crust, that way we have too many neutrons, so we have also a gas or liquid, let's say, and probably a super fluid, super liquid, super fluid, so of neutrons outside the nuclei. And then in the core, we, we have homogeneous matter. No? So this is a log scale in density, so it, it gives enormous importance to the crust and very little importance to the crop, to the core. No? But remember, this is about half a kilometer or one kilometer in thickness, and this is 10 to 12 kilometers. So, so much of the matter is in the core. So the core is not going to react too much, and this is going to react violently to the accretion. And if I'm correct, now you will have a movie, you will see how the temperature profile evolve in the crust, and this red little dot will show you how the surface is evolving, so that gives you the time evolution of the star. So obviously the low density part heats up very rapidly, and the high density, the higher the density, the slower is the evolution. And then nothing happened, and then suddenly it cools down. Now, if we would be interested in what's happening in the outer part, so this outer part of the crust reacts very rapidly because it's low density, it has a small heat capacity, so it, it can follow the accretion rate very easily. So now we have a, a more detailed model where the accretion rate will follow the, the, the flux that are observed directly. So we'll have two models. The previous one is a black curve, which has a constant accretion rate, and the red one will follow exactly the data. So we have basically measurement of the flux from the system every day. We convert this flux into a mass accretion rate. And uh, so th there are pretty big variations. And here you will see the temperature profile of it evolves. No? So initially, the two models have exactly the same temperature. But once accretion go on, you will see a red on the black uh, temperature profile. No? And again, you will see the black dot and the red dot that show you the temporal evolution. So at high density, there's not much effect. But in the low density part, then it, it, it is important to follow exactly the accretion rate. Hmm? Particularly when we have data point in the very early phase, um, if we can fit the early data point or not is important by having the, the detailed temperature profile. So that's one, one of the things we learn. Now, let me show you a, a very interesting example, which is with, it's like a counter example. It will be bad at the end, but it's an interesting case that uh, the source in Aquila X1. So, so this shows that even if you have short accretion outburst of a few months, like this, these guys are accreting like two months almost every year. So here you see a summary from different satellites for uh, almost 20 years, and you have 23 accretion outbursts, all of them identified here. Of course, at low flux, it's a little bit messy just because you have a lot of background noise. No? So we have here 23 accretion outbursts, and it turned out that in five of them, the outbursts 14, 19, 20, 21, and 23, we also have much more detailed observation of the cooling at, after the outburst. So here are the cooling curve after this outburst 14, 19, 20, 21, and 23. And here's the, th the theoretical model. So it was also part of Laura Otes' uh, PhD. So this is the, 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 the 
the modeling of the effective temperature during each one of these outbursts, and in five of them, we have some data point. So this is a pretty good model that fits the data point where you see the fit, it's pretty good. And uh, this definitely requires some shallow heating. And we have here the amount of shallow heating we need and the density at which this shallow heating must occur. And that's very disturbing because we, we would like to understand what is this. We, we don't know what it is. There was no theory from it. It was a surprise when it came out. And so you want to characterize it and uh, the first characterization is that it turned out that from one outburst to the other, the shallow heating is different. From here, you need about 3 MeV, then 1.3, at almost 4, 2.3, then one, oops, sorry, 1 MeV. And, and the density at which is occurring also changed from one outburst to the other. So it, 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 it's kind of a problem. It's not clear what it is. This is a, a, a much bigger calculation that we did with uh, Laura, never published. So we did a big Monte Carlo simulation of it. And uh, it, it show you also the amount of shallow heating that was inputted in, in the previous calculation and the new calculation with uh, Monte Carlo. And what was definitely clear, when we look at the old burst 21 and 23, that the one that had much more difference. Now here we have like more than two MeV and this one, one MeV. So by exploring this very carefully, we see from the Monte Carlo, the distribution of the strength of the shallow heating and the density at which it occurs. So that we get, so it, it's uh, from half a Sigma to three Sigma from all burst 21 and all burst 23. So they're definitely incompatible. So de definitely this shallow heating, which we don't know what it is, but it has different strengths in two different outbursts and it distributed at a different density. And actually these two outbursts are extremely similar. The 21 and 23, these are these two. Hmm? And uh, so, so th th that's a disturbing result, but that life, okay. So there is something we have to learn about this. So in summary, what we have learned from this is that first the matter does crystallize and it's not an amorphous solid and neutrons are very likely superfluid. So this agrees with the theory, but it's, it's never bad to have experimental or observational confirmation of the theory. And then the, the result from Brahman coming that the thermal conductivity cannot be too high. So the crystal is not perfect. It is impure and there is an extra energy source that we don't know what it is and it developed the shallow heating okay so now let me go to the guy that is in the title of my talk so that the source the neutron star is a maxi j0556 menu 332 so this is a very special case here's the figure we show you uh, i think 10 2 4 5 the four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, we have 10 uh, cross cooling events from nine different sources, two, two of them from the same source. They are here and here. Mm -hmm. And the, so, so you see in that case, again, with the time in the log scale after the end of the accretion and the effective temperature and electron volt. And you, you see, I mean, the diversity is almost a factor two in difference in temperature which depends on the type of star, the accretion rate, the length of the accretion phase, et cetera. But basically there is a, an overall similar behavior. They come out pretty hot and they cool down in the scale of a few years. And again, in, in, in several of these cases, we need an extra source of shallow heating to explain the first few points. You know? In some cases, we don't need the shallow heating. And uh, here's the maxi source that it's third old burst. So it, it looked like the, the other one. It was a little bit hotter than the other one. It has a very high accretion rate, close to the Eddington rate. But when it was discovered, that was early, the first cooling curve of this source, it was discovered in 2015, what did I say, 2011, sorry, 2011. It was outrageously hot. It's two or three times hotter than the other one. Mm -hmm. It was very anomalous case. So in the first interpretation, we, we tried to model it with shallow heating. We say, okay, there's a huge amount of shallow heating. That was our, our first work. 
with Alex Dybal, who was a graduate student of uh, Ed, Ed Brown, and with Ed Brown and Andrew Cumming and, and myself. So we could fit the cooling curve pretty well from the first outburst. Here, there was a second very weak accretion bur outburst, but we need some en enormous amount of shallow heating. So six to eight MeV. Notice an interesting thing. This star is extremely far away. It's completely outside the galaxy at a very stand, which is something like 40 to 45 kiloparsec. No? So the system that was kicked out of the, of the it, it received a very strong kick, no? which is typical of what neutron star get in, in supernovae. And it's interesting that the system was not disrupted with the kick. No? The neutron star came out with this companion star and it, it's out there and it's accreting. And it's enormously hot star. An interesting thing also, when you see the temperature profile at the end of the accretion phase, so it goes well above 10 to the 9 Kelvin at this density. And it, it turned out that actually this is like a maximum cooling of the star because you, it's almost impossible to get hotter than this because neutrino emission here becomes so strong that even if you inject more energy into the star, it's not going to get hotter. It all will go into neutrinos. No? So we are like a maximum cooling of the star, no? not the minimal cooling, the maximum cooling. You, you cannot go further than that. that no? And apparently when magnetars also have very strong heating events, they, they get almost the same kind of temperature just after the, the, the explosion. And it's again limited by neutrinos. No? So the, the maximum temperature you can get because of neutrino cooling. And it's interesting also that the putative neutron star in, in the supernova remnant of the 1987A uh, supernova, this neutron star may have shown some indication of its existence. And its temperature turns out also to be now of the order of, of three to 400 electron volt. And it's again due to neutrino. It was very hot and it cooled down very rapidly to this. So it's kind of uniform, universal temporary profile for the hottest possible star. So this guy was there. It was as hot as it could be. Then it turned out that a few years later, it had a, a third accretion outburst. So here you see the observation from Maxi. So the count per second. This is from the Swift. So this is a lot scale, no? And this effective temperature of measurement in quiescent. So you have an outburst, which you see more clearly here, no? Then the, temp the, the flux drops. You had a small outburst here, which, which you, you see in the theoretical curve here. I'll comment about it no? later. And a short outburst, but it had almost no effect on the cooling curve. And then a few years later, it had a, a third outburst, pretty strong again. And here we see some cooling event. So we model this again, that was part of Laura's PhD thesis. And so we have the cooling model for the first, the second, and the third outburst. And in, in this case, looking at the best fit, Laura found that you, you need even much higher uh, amount of shallow heating in the first outburst. So she found 17 MeV, which is more twice as much as was in the previous uh, model. And then, but for the second outburst, you need basically no shallow heating. So that's a small one here. And, and so, so that was also what we found with, with Alex Dybor, that that would be the effect of the, the evolution of the temperature of the star in the second accretion outburst if it had shallow heating and in the first outburst. So this would clearly overshoot these two data points. So we already concluded at that time that there was very little or even no shallow heating during the, the second outburst compared to enormously high shallow heating the first one. And this was confirmed here. If in the second outburst we would put the same amount of shallow heating the first one, you would completely overshoot. And then we have a third outburst and we need some shallow heating, but not too much. Here you see without it, we clearly miss the first four, four point. And uh, so that's it. We, we have another example here after the Aquila X1 which requires different amount of shallow heating in almost every burst. Now we have a system with three accretional bursts. We need three amount of shallow heating. So that was kind of depressing because we don't know what this shallow heating is, and we cannot even parameterize it in a reasonable way. It, it does whatever it wants. Different stars have different amount of shallow heating, and even in the same star in different accretional bursts, 
the shallow heating chain from one case to the other one. But then, okay, so that, that was the bad news. Hmm? So it, it looked like there's almost no hope we can understand anything in that. And the shallow heating can be enormous. It's even much stronger than the deep crustal heating. And the deep crustal heating, we have a nice model. As I show, even if you change the parameter, different group make different assumptions. They're basically all the same results between one and two MeV. Here we have something which is zero of the order, almost one MeV, and it can be enormously high. But then we have a nice guy. Um, the SUSEMIC B 1659, so that was the second one to go into quiescence. So we had the first cooling curve that was um, that in starting in 2000, and it has a second outburst, and I don't remember the year 2013 or 15 or something like this. So this is the first outburst. And the second one is similar but shorter. This is about two and a half years, it's only one and a half years. And you, have, you can fit the cooling curve with the first old bus and the second one. And actually, you could almost predict the cooling curve of the second old bus by fitting the first one, by pinning down the amount of shallow heating in the first old bus. And you could essentially predict the evolution of the second old bus. So this was fantastic. You say, wow, we understand something. We can predict what's going to happen. And it's in completely, complete contradiction to, to the other two cases, no? And, uh, but at least there's some hope that th this guy has a decent behavior. Hmm? So that's the good news. So in the same sense, the shallow heating may not change from old burst to old burst. And then came the nice new, this same star, uh, no, the, the, sorry, the same star, the maxi one, the, the messy one that had really weird behavior, it, it came out to, to accurate for a false time. So, yeah, so I go to this guy with a huge shallow heating. So it was discovered in, two, in January 2011 when he started accreting, had never seen before. So he's here, you see the mass accretion, sorry. You see the mass accretion rate. So the first outburst from January 2011 to 2012, a second short outburst, the third one in 2015, 2016, you look at the values, these are 10 to the 18 gram per second. So it, it's almost always close to the Eddington mass accretion rate. And then the third one in 2020. And here are the temperature measurement after the accretion. No? So this I will show you, we fit this, and we, have, we found that for to fit these three old bursts, we need different amount of shallow heating. So then we have one more data point. So I got the data from Jero and Honan, who is the PI of the investigations that was early last year, so we started to, to model this. So, okay, now we have four bursts, so let's do it, but very, very carefully. So I did a gigantic calculation. We now have a very nice Monte Carlo code, so we, we can run millions of models in a few days. So I decided, okay, we're going to, to pin down this guy and understand what he's doing. So try to parameterize all our ignorance as widely as possible, to be as generous as possible, or as pessimistic as possible. So in my simulation, I vary the mass on the radius of the star, which of course we have no indication of what they are, so we have to make a guess. The cold temperature of the star before the beginning of the accretion 10 years ago, we have no indication of what it was, so it's a free parameter. We have to, mod to parameterize what's happening in the end block. So what, what amount of light elements like helium, even carbon we have in the end block, and depending on the burning deeper, we will have heavier element. So we have a different amount of light element in each outburst. This amount of light element is determined by the accretion and the burning during the outburst. So it can be different after each accretion outburst. Then we have the thermal conductivity in the crust. So there is no reason for this impurity to be the same everywhere. There, there are still processing of the matter when it goes deeper into the crust. So I divide the crust in five density region and assume different impurity into them. So this is another Monte Carlo parameters. It can take any value between zero and 100 if every one of this uh, layer. And then we have the shallow heating. So we are, it's, more, it's parameterized by the strength and the density at which it occurs. And I assume it, uh, it uh, acting in a density range from this raw shallow up to five-time raw shadow. 
and then 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 the rest is typical. We we take a crust equation of the from Enson and Stunik, so that it has a deep crustal heating of 1.92 mEV per nucleon, and I fix a superfluid gap from from these people. Now the modeling of the shallow heating. So to be very specific in this model, so it's very similar to the deep crustal heating. So this is the, the total heating rate, the luminosity, no? so this is Rx per second injected into the star from the deep crustal heating or from the shallow. So it is proportional to the mass accretion rate. So we take the mass accretion rate divided by the atomic mass unit. So that give me a number of nucleon per second and I multiply by the strength of it. No? So the strength of the deep shallow heating is 1.92. This one, I take any value needed of that the Monte Carlo will tell us what I need for this shallow heating. Then it is distributed in density. So from this distribution is down to the Hansen and Stonic model. I show you previously how it goes. So we have many reaction in the outer crust down to the inner crust where this uh, 1.92 MeV is distributed. And the shallow heating, I take a range from one to five times this Monte Carlo parameter three shallow. No? So I have Sorry, almost- May I ask you a question? Yes. Do you know that equation of state of Hansel's Dunic in the inner crust is wrong? Yeah, yeah. Together it, with, it, the, with the deep crustal heating emission, 1.92 MeV per nucleon. Yes, I, I agree. We, we, we have to take into account your, your better model, yeah. Mm. I would also like to emphasize that uh, your review up to the slides, slide 30, uh, 37, mm -hmm. is also interesting, but a bit outdated because they used, uh, you are discussing the results which are based on the in, uh, equation of state of the Hansel and Zdunik. They yes. are heavily mm -hmm. based on this. So uh, I think it would be honest at least to mention that you, the, thank you mm -hmm. that your equation of state which are using you are mm -hmm. using is incorrect yes uh, i agree with you i, I don't think it makes so big why, why why don't you mention it yeah i i'm sorry i i still have read carefully your papers and understood them so i, I, I that's that is your problem yes sorry. it's my problem you, you're perfectly yeah. right yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. my yeah. Yes, it's your problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th thank you for mentioning. I, I have to include this and we have to, but it's a lot of reading and a lot of... Uh, and much Not so much. Than... These are very short papers and clearly written. I, I agree. I agree with you. I have to do this, yeah. Daniel, it, it, sorry, so it's going to make a difference. I don't think the difference is going to be enormous because it's deep in the crust, but but definitely it's something that has to be done. But at least your review and the the results obtained in the slide discussed in the slide thirty seven, mm -hmm. they are heavily based on the uh, in the crust equation of state of. Uh, sorry, which yeah, uh, thirty six, thirty six. No, yeah, this one, these results. Yes, I believe yeah, that. Yeah, no, no, no. definitely. 36. Uh -huh. Well, all, all of them. I mean, obviously, all the previous calculation from everybody use something like Hadzanon's Nikon similar to. Oh, so they should be reconsidered, and it would be hmm, better to mention it, at least. Yes, you, you're sorry. Uh, I apologize. Yeah, I have to, to have this. Would that you do it? That, that, uh, that at least now I have. <laughs> The, the punishment of, of not mentioning it. I have to do this, yeah. Daniel, mm -hmm. may I ask you? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, is it any reason to expect uh, that the, uh, the bursting itself uh, should occur in the same matter, in the same way? Every boost should proceed uh, the reaction rate, just the same. Um. The explosion it's itself. Now, which way do you mean? I mean the the reaction net in in each explosion is the same. Is it any reason to expect that the reaction net? Okay, the the reaction. Okay, here he, I mean here have two in, in thermonuclear burst, not inside the crust, but in 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 the thermonuclear burst. 
Ah, no, definitely. The, the thermal nuclear burst can be different because it depends on the accretion rate. No? Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. So I, I'm not modeling the, the thermal nuclear burst. No? I, I understand, but I just, just interesting. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I have it somewhat in this model, no? that the, the amount of light element in the envelope can be different in each outburst. And we'll see that fitting, fitting the data indicate that it does change from one outburst to the other. So it means the thermal nuclear burning has been different. Thank you. But it could be different only in the last few days, okay? Because this amount of light element in the envelope, it, it takes a few days to accumulate it. No? Mm -hmm. So we, we're not sensitive to, to the full, uh, the integration of it all the time. No? And, and here for the reaction in the crust, yeah, well, but that's, let's say the standard wisdom or, or the educated guess that it, it's just proportional to the mass accretion rate. And the shallow heating, we don't know what it is. So my model here that I'm going to use, assume the shallow heating is distributed in some density range and is proportional, directly proportional to M dot. And uh, it could be wrong. Let's say it's like Occam results. So I, I, I take this, the, the simplest possible model and see if it works. Hmm? So here, what it does when I fit, so I fit this four accretion outbursts for this maxi source. And here's the distribution from the Monte Carlo. So this is about 2 million cooling curve. And uh, I find for each accretion outburst, different value of the strength of the shallow heating. These are values in MeV. And the density at which the shallow heating is, has to be deposited. No? So the first outburst is very narrowly defined. And the second outburst could be almost anything. Because the, the, if you look actually at, at the data, the second outburst is occurring here. You see, it's basically one single cooling curve. No? It has no effect, the second outburst on the cooling. So, so the shallow heating, the only thing you can deduce, it, it has to be relatively weak. No? In the third outburst, then we have uh, seven data points here. So, so, so the shallow heating is more clearly, there is an effect, definitely. So we get better constraint on the shallow heating in the third outburst. So it has a strength of about half an MeV. And the fourth one, we cannot say much again because there's only one data point, no? but, but it is there, okay. So we see again, very different shallow heating. The first one, enormously high amount of energy and much smaller heating in the third, second, third and fourth one. No? Here I cut at 20 MeV is the maximum value because as I said, if, if we put more, all the energy goes into neutrinos. So you have to cut it at some point. No? So it could be anything even higher than 20 MeV, no? but the neutrino will evaporate it. And, but if you look at this, you say, okay, in this three one here, the density at which I have to apply it, it's poorly defined. So it could be the same density and even the strength could be the same. No? It could be like half an MeV for all of them. So what is this true? So I, I did a second run where instead of having four different parameterizations of shallow heating, I have only two. One for the first outburst, which is clearly different, and the same amount of shallow heating in the outburst two and three and four. And here's the distribution I get. So the fit to the data is equally good. And of course, I have exactly the same amount of shallow heating because that's my condition for the second one. They have the same distribution. And of course, they're completely different in outburst two, three, and four and one. No? Oh. So I found here that actually outburst two, three, and four can be modeled like in the source MSB 1659. We, we can model it with exactly the same amount of shallow heating in this. So only the first outburst is completely different. So in some kind, we, we're progressing. We, we say, okay, we have another system. system. So that with the second one, where you have some consistency on this mysterious shallow heating. And, but this is completely off. But again, if, if you look at, at all, all the data, they, they were here, you know? This is the first outburst. I mean, it's outrageously half off. So been wondering about what's happening there and say, okay, what, what it, this is not shallow heating. Okay, we, we tried with shallow heating, the result is ridiculous. The amount of energy you have to use in that case is 20 times more, 10 times, 20 times more than in all of the cases. So it has to be something different. And you say, well, this guy have a nuclear explosion. What it is, 
some kind of nuclear explosion that occurred during the first old birth. So, uh, why am I? So I'm going to try that. Okay, assume instead of continuous shallow heating propose that follows a mass accretion rate, I just deposit all the energy somewhere at one time instead of depositing it all the time and see what I need. Does it make sense? So I, I think in terms of a thermonuclear explosion, so I have a maximum density so that the density of the hyperburst at which energy is deposited, sorry. Uh, so it would be basically from low density to this rho Hb. I deposited energy uniformly per gram. I have a parameter which is amount of energy and liberate. So I take a scale of the order of 10 to the 18 erg per gram. 10 to the 18 erg per gram correspond to a nuclear energy of 1 MeV per nucleon. So nuclear reaction are of the order of 1 MeV per nucleon. So I take this as a scale and I multiply it by some number which can be anything and the Monte Carlo will tell me what it has to be. And also a time at which is energy deposited. Numerically, I deposit this during 200 seconds at that time. So the code slow down, take very, very small time step around here, and then suddenly deposit as energy everywhere uniformly per mass from the lower boundary condition, which is 10 to the 8 gram per cubic centimeter, up to this uh, density. So I have three parameters, no? no temperature requirement, just the density, the total energy, and the time. I run it and I see if I can feed the data. And it turns out I can feed the data very well. Again, this is the same figure I showed you before. Mm -hmm. So this is a mass accretion rate estimated from the flux. So 10 to the 18 is about Eddington rate. No? So this guy is accreting most of the time at Eddington rate. The four outburst. This is the, the theory that fits the data. So you see here's a spike in effective temperature. So that was the explosion occurred. And you see the cooling curve and we get an extremely good fit to the data. With the shallow heating, I get equally good fit to the data, no? but this works equally well. Then I show you for the four phase after each outburst. This is now a log scale. So we can see in detail what's happening early on. We get a very good fit to the data here. I have some model that can even fit the first data point. No? So it works very well. In this case, I had 1.6 solar mass neutron star, 11.2 kilometers and the shallow heating. So I assume here the shallow heating is the same in all four outbursts and on top of it, I put an explosion in the first one. So the shallow heating is 390 uh, kV, initial temperature is of 10 to the seven Kelvin. And I get to fit to the data of 90 data point to give me 24.6 of chi square. So here in more detail what's happening, here we get the temperature profile just when the explosion is going to start. So from the surface, 10 to the 8 gram per cubic centimeter down to the center of the star. So that's what we get. This is where the shallow heating is occurring. And uh, this is the temperature profile without shallow heating. So you see that this amount of energy, which was just 390 kV, heat up the outer crust from here to here. No? And at the point where the explosion is going to occur. Mm -hmm. And this is the temperature evolution at that point, no? in function of time, during the accretion. So initially it goes up very rapidly, and then it slowly reached kind of a steady state. And then you have the bang at the time of the explosion, and the star came out pretty hot. Mm -hmm. Here we see the temperature profile during the outburst before the explosion. So remember that it, it first have a very strong spike in accretion, then it goes down, no? and the, the explosion occurs around there. So during the early spike of accretion, uh, the auto part gets very hot. So this is 48 days after the, the beginning of the accretion, so that the peak in the accretion rate. And then accretion goes down, decrease. So the temperature in the auto part decrease because this is low density, it follows the mass accretion rate very rapidly. Deeper with higher density, higher specific heat, then this does not follow instantaneously what's happening. It's more like a cumulative effect. So we see that initially the star, this is an initial star long before the accretion. So after 48 days, we're on the green curve, then it go to the purple and slowly you see that this point is heating up. No? Even if the outer part is cooling down, the heat here is flowing into this region 
and this layer is heating up, which is what we see here. This is exactly the same, no? Until it reaches explosion point. No? And this is sorry, after. Sorry. May I ask you? Is yes. this an explosion point? Is this an ex a red red circle? Is the explosion point uh, at this particular place of the crust, or everywhere? No, the explosion goes everywhere. I, I I distribute energy from the surface down to this point. But how does it happen? Because the, the explosion starts at one point when the um, some yeah. critical condition will be reached. Exactly. Yeah, I, I assume the critical condition will be at the highest density. And then you assume that after that, in, in 200 seconds, all the crust is explosively born, burned. Then, then the explosion will propagate everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, in, in, but, in, yes. But in, the typical time scale, I, I suspect it's not hundreds of seconds, seconds. It's much, much larger. It's uh, thousands. Uh, according to my estimate, it's about 10,000 seconds at, at, at the very least. Um, I believe it much, much larger, in fact. It, so it how, how you, how you uh, obtain an explosive burning of the whole, this gigantic energy at, in, in just yes. that, 100 that, seconds? seconds. Let, let's say my, my first step model, no? I, I want to, to see if it works, so I try as simple as possible. But, and, then, uh, but then, if the typical time scheme is larger, then the thermal conduction effects could come into play. Which, right, but you, you which say prevent, then, which prevent will, will prevent the the hyperburst occurrence. Wait a second, but uh, the time scale. I mean, when the explosion start at one point. I mean, I just I spun myself from from normal X ray burst, which are of very low density. But in, in normal X-ray bursts, explosions start at one point at the surface of the star, and it propagates on the full surface in a few milliseconds. Hmm. But and here, the, the, this, here, this, this situation is different because it's it's mainly uh, it's Pikna well, it's Pikna nuclear regime with some ther thermal correction, as I understand. Yes, yes, it so is. The effect of temperature is not so dramatic. No, so it, so it probably goes differently, yes. Mm -hmm. So I believe uh, one should be very, very careful. It's, it's, it's not like, like in the very, in the purely thermal, thermal regime. No, it is not. It is, it is weakly thermonuclear. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. And this could be very different. Well, at it, least to my estimates, the typical okay. time scale is, is much, much larger than 200 seconds. Yeah, well, two, 200 seconds was just numerically, because if I inject the energy instantaneously, the cold crash. So I decided, OK, I split it in 200 seconds so that I can inject this energy everywhere at that point. No? Uh, this is, this is the first, it's the first try. No, I try the simplest possible model, see if it works. If it works, then we, we can make the physics better. No? But you're right, it, it's a graph approximation. But even if it takes tens of thousands of seconds, it's less than one day. No? So may, maybe the difference is not, not enormous. I don't know. We, we have to do it. I'm sure hopefully you can do it and, and see what is the effect. But here, here's the effect of what, what I found after the explosion. So this is the temporary profile. Before the explosion, I inject this energy, and I take 200 seconds so that the code can numerically do it. It's not, not an explosion code, but in 200 yeah, seconds. I, I understand what you are doing. <clears throat> yeah. 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 So, so this is the number two after the explosion. I also avoided to deposit energy just at the outer boundary to avoid problem with outer boundary. No? And I see here after one day after the explosion, this is the temperature profile I get. No? So this part when I artificially decide not to inject energy, the heat already flows there. No? So I get a temperature profile from heat transport. This is mostly neutrino cooling. No? And it goes ra down rapidly and after one day, after 10 days, I'm down here. You see, after 10 days, we start having, well, this is a one day profile. This is a 10 day profile. This is the end of the accretion, 21 days after the explosion. And then this is 10 day, 100 days during the cooling phase. No? So essentially, the density at which it has to explode is what determines 
how much energy can flow deeper and this energy will be stored and reproduce the cooling curve because it, it takes several years for the star to recover from that. And that's why we did very high uh, densities. Yeah. Okay, so that's my model, no? A, a first step and, and very simple. Now, if I compare the three scenarios, so scenario A is shallow heating, scenario B also, and scenario C is the one with the hyperburst. Scenario A, I have four different types of shallow heating in each accretion load burst. Scenario B, I have only two types of, uh, of uh, shallow heating. One very strong one is the first old burst, and then the same shallow heating in old burst two, three, and four. Scenario C, I have the same shallow heating all the time, and I have a hyperburst. And you can see the chi-square distribution is basically the same. So, so in, in all kind, all, all scenario, I can fit the data equally well. No? B would be favored because you have much less parameters than A. But B and C are basically the same number of parameters. I think here I have 16 and then shallow heat in the model C have 17 parameters. No? So statistically, these two models are equivalent. I like scenario C better because I mean, it implies two things that first I have the same shallow, shallow heating all the time. So it gives us some hope that we could figure out what is the shallow heating. This it is constant, consistent in one star. And uh, it, for, for the huge energy input in the first old burst, I mean, it, it could be some kind of pseudo thermonuclear or, or picno thermonuclear explosion. And it fits the data very well. Well, let me just give you some, some idea of what the energetic of it. So the total amount of energy released by the hyperburst is the order of 10 to the 44 eggs, which is comparable to a magnetar giant flare. The total amount of heating during my calculation, so it is uh, the hyperburst, the shallow heating and the deep crustal heating is a little bit higher than just the explosion. This is a neutrino loss in the crust. So we see a large part of the energy emitted is lost into neutrinos. This is the total energy lost into photon, which is more than the neutrino. This is the ratio of the photon energy loss to, to the total heating, so the hyperburst and the shallow heating. So, so you see that neutrinos do contribute something. No? Just a first step no? to, to indicate what, what the energy is. And, and then this is a maximum luminosity coming out of the star, and that, that will eventually be emitted at the surface at the time of the, well, a little bit later after the explosion. So the, the temperature, go, the flux coming out goes up with some, some delay and the maximum luminosity coming out is the order of 10 to the 36 Earth per, Earth per second. So this is a bit bad because at that time, the star was accreting close to Eddington rate. So the luminosity, observed luminosity is like 10 to the 38. And this hyperburst only produced about 1% fluctuation. So unfortunately, there is very little hope to see the hyperburst in the data. Hmm? However, we know in the case of the superburst, which are much less energetic, but are also still deep, the hyperburst appear to be at a density of 10 to the 11. The superburst are like a density of 10 to the 9 gram per cubic centimeter. But the superburst and, and the cooling of the superburst last 10 to 15 hours, but, but all of them show a regular burst a few seconds before the superburst. No? So it looks like the superburst explosion triggers a thermonuclear explosion at low density. So it's possible that the hyperburst should do something at the surface. No? But I'm not modeling the low density part, so I have no idea. But, it, but since it happened in, in superburst, maybe there would be something happening at low densities that could be detectable. No? We haven't looked for it. But the hyperburst itself has zero effect at the surface. It is too deep. No? And also the shallow heating we need. So that's the same shallow heating in all during the four accretion node bursts. So we need a little bit than, than in the previous calculation, but it's less than one MeV. And it's very shallow. And I think that the density at which it has to act is definitely below 10 to the 10 gram per cubic centimeters. It could be even below 10 to the eight, but 10 to the eight is my outer boundary. You know? So it, it looks like it is really shallow in that case. You know? What does it mean? I don't know. So I hope when we have more data point to, to push low, lower bound, to do the calculation again, put the lower boundary to lower density and see really if, if the stop goes up and reach 
and has to be deposited really a very low density or if it, it, it is in this density range. No? So that's a, another question for the next paper. No? Let's see my next slide. Okay, so the parametrization of the, the explosion, uh, the density at which it occurs is roughly uh, slightly above 10 to the 11 gram per cubic centimeter. The time of the explosion is really at the very end of the accretion or birth. This is at the end of the accretion. It lasted 1.3136 years. No? So it likes to put it very late. This X is a fraction of energy. Remember the energy at deposit per gram was 10 to the 18 Earth per gram multiplied by this X HB. So 10 to the 18 is like one MB per nucleon. And so the X HB could be like the mass fraction of the nuclei that explode. So it turned out to be a order of 1%. No? So this indicates that the, the light element that explodes there was well representing about 1% or a few percent of the total, uh, total amount of nuclei in the medium at this density. No? I cut it at 5% because I could go to higher explosion, but again, everything goes into neutrinos, so there's nothing interesting. But nicely, we see a peak of the other 1%. Mm -hmm. And then I can also get the temperature at the time of the explosion. So these were my parameters of my Monte Carlo. No? The density, the time of the explosion, and the total energy. This is the result of the calculation. That the temperature of the crust at the point where it explodes. So, so that is red dot here. No? So this is not a parameter of the calculation. It comes out of the calculation. So it, it's a few times, about three times 10 to 8 Kelvin. Now the correlation between the parameters, there's something interesting. So this is, so I, I show here though, the mass and radius of the star, the density and the, the temperature no, and the time. So we have a bimodal distribution. So most of the model like very heavy star with about 10 to the five kilometers but we have model with more reasonable mass of the other 1.5 and 12 kilometers. No? So we have a bimodal distribution. The strongest peak is here. The strongest peak is also correlated in terms of the time of the explosion. So there's a strong peak just right at the end of the old birth. So, so I, I find it a bit embarrassing no? that you just explode and accretion stopped. You may think that the, the explosion may stop the accretion, but I show you that the explosion had no effect at the surface. The luminosity coming out is completely negligible. So I don't think that the explosion could affect the accretion disk. No? So I find this a little bit phony. No? Well, this one, this peak here is here, no? the second peak with lower mass, slightly higher radius, and the explosion in that case would have occurred maybe a few weeks before the end of the old birth. That's only a little bit more acceptable. No? And uh, now, now the, the next question, okay, what, what exploded? We expect this to be low Z nuclei, but we know that the same mechanism in the head and tunic and everything that everybody would do there. You, you take any nucleus and you push it to high density, it's going to capture electrons, so the Z is going to decrease. And uh, so this as a function of density. This is a range where the explosion occurred. And uh, I start with different nuclei, so the nuclei with A equal Z, uh, sorry, Z equal N, no? there are even nuclei with the same amount of neutrons and protons. So Z equal six, this is carbon up to Z equal 16. I think this is uh, 16, this is one, no? It's, uh, what is it? Sulfur. No? And you push it to high density at some point, they capture an electron and the two electrons, no? The first one is in equilibrium, the second one, because you get an odd non-nucleus, it immediately captures a second electron. So you see only all cases increasing the density, the Z radius, and I can get a prediction of what, what would be the low Z nuclei here, and I can see where they come from. Then I will look at the nuclear reaction rate and which one of these guys could explode given the, temp the density and the temperature I need, and then I can extrapolate where they come from and look a bit at the nuclear burning at low density. From, so from people who do the nuclear burning in, in the ocean, the X-ray burst and this, and they can predict me what kind of nuclei I get. So I can find my initial nuclei and see which one would produce the explosion if it works. 
So I will see it basically is equal eight and 10. Z6 would explode well before at much lower density, but actually Z6 carbon is what is thought to be the, the fuel for the superburst and they explode at density of the order of 10 to the nine gram per cubic centimeter. So around here, while we, we need explosion and 10 to the 11. So it, it would be then equal eight and 10. So Z equal eight, it would be basically oxygen 20 or oxygen 24, which would come from neon and magnesium. Or if it is Z equal 10, it would be neon 28 or 32, which called from, sili from silicon or sulfur. And then I look at the reaction rate. So first I had a hard time and then I realized that people already thought about it and everything had been calculated. A large part of the calculation were done by, by Dima in collaboration with the people from Gina. So they, they had already calculated hundreds, maybe thousands of S factors. So to do the reaction, I, I do the typical thing. I, I represent the cross section instead of the astrophysical S factors. I use a huge collection of S factors from uh, Afanasyev 2010. Then I get uh, the reaction rate. So the thermonuclear reaction rate is a typical value that you find in any book of uh, stellar evolution. And then uh, in the case when you have very high density and low temperatures, so it become close to the peak non-nuclear rate. And it turned out that this had been done already by Gaskers and Yakovlev like 15 years ago. So basically take, we take the same formula, but we affect these two factors, particularly these exponential factors is strongly affected. And the peak energy is also changed in the peak non-nuclear regime. Mm -hmm. Now, peak non-nuclear regime usually is miserable. So th there is like 10 orders of magnitude difference in the prediction of the screening. So uh, these people nicely for me decided what is, they, they classified a minimum rate, a maximum rate and an optimal rate. So, so I, I took the minimum and the maximum and see what happened. I'm pretty ignorant about nuclear reactions. So, I found it very nice that people did the job for me before I could just the two extreme case and see what it does. So I can get the rate and then from rate, I can get the energy generation, just the Q factor. So the energy released by the reaction times the rate divided by the density. And I calculate the lifetime, which is the density of the nucleus over the rate R. So here at three, the example, which so it's going to be oxygen and, and neon. So this is will be the rate at three different, four different density. Here are the density I consider, which are close to the range that I need, or at least what I found from the Monte Carlo. And so this is nuclear burning, and this is the derivative because that's what be the criteria. I need the, the temperature sensitivity of the nuclear reaction rate, and that that's how it goes. And, and then I can compare this rate to the thermonuclear rate and get the screening. So here is the screening, the effect of the screening. So it's enormous. Hmm? Uh, it, it, it could be even 120. So it's not the factor of 120, it's 120 orders of magnitude. Hmm? And even these, there are at least 10 orders of magnitude uncertainty between different models of the screening. If you want detail, ask Dima. Um, I, I just took the result from his paper. And, uh, but so that's basically what I do. No? All right, so I have my nuclear energy generation and that's what I will need, the temperature dependence of the nuclear burning to see how it, uh, if it can explode. Okay, so having this, so a, a typical condition to see if it's going to explode is to compare the, the nuclear burning rate and the cooling. So the, the cooling would be done by diffusion. So imagine you have a layer in the star, suddenly for some reason, for some reason, nuclear reaction start to increase, it gets hotter, but getting hotter is going to cool more efficiently. So you want to compare which one is going to be the most efficient. Is the nuclear energy reaction rate or the cooling rate? Mm -hmm. So if the cooling is more strongly affected by the temperature than the, the nuclear burning, there will be no explosion. Mm -hmm. The energy injected by the nuclear reaction will just be diffused away by the cooling. However, if, if we go the other way, then the nuclear will win over the cooling and the temperature will increase, 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 and it's going to explode. So here, my, my estimation, so to show you my ignorance, in, in the first version of the paper that in the archive, I, I had estimated that the, the, 
epsilon cool dt was of the order of 10 to the 2 in CGS, no? So epsilon cool is measured in Erg per gram per second per Kelvin. And I had an estimate of 10 to the 2, and it turned out to be completely wrong. And it's act actually more like 10 to the minus 2. So I think this is a more reasonable value. So I take the minimal rate and the maximum rate, and I calculate the d epsilon nu dt that give me 10 to the minus 2 for the carbon burning, uh, yeah, carbon burning, oxygen burning, and neon burning. And each one of these lines assume a different mass fraction of the, of the nucleus. No? So the first one, I, and I assume it's a pure, carb, a pure uh, oxygen, then I have a mass fraction of 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, minus 5, and minus 6. Then I switch to the, the other one. So why do I take this range? Well, just for curiosity and see what happened, because all this curve cover everything, and then we can choose a preferred model. No? For example, a mass fraction of one, that, that may happen, if, even if I see that the total mass fraction of the, from the energetic, I need about 1% of the exploding material in the medium. That was this restriction I found here. No? So from the energetic, one um, of the other 1% of the nuclei at this density are the ones that provide energy. But we know from the result of Chuck Horowitz and collaborators when they do the, the crystallization and they show that when you have a mixture of elements, it's very likely that the light element, when the heavy element crystallized, the light element will be expelled from the heavy element. So you may have some bubble of light element, very concentrated, that remain in the medium of a much heavier element. So actually in the condition of the explosion, maybe, the, the mass fraction is close to one. So that will be something like this. If it's not separated, so we don't have bubble of light element into heavy element, then we will be in a much smaller mass fraction. And the 1% of I need is minus two would be this curve. No? It could be also that the exploding nucleus is very small fraction, but when it start heating and exploding, you have also a nuclei with slightly higher Z that also explode. No? So the exploding, Sorry, let me let the helicopter go. Very noisy. Okay, so so it it could be actually that the exploding nuclei which triggers explosion is a very low mass fraction, but when it start heating up, all the nuclei with higher Z can contribute. So in this case, maybe the mass fraction could be ten to the minus three, four, five, and even six. It could explode. No? So, so that, that's just the first try. No? And, and, I, and this is a distribution of the, the temperature at the explosion and the density from the Monte Carlo. No? And there's one sigma and two sigma and three sigma. So I see it's unlikely to be carbon. It barely makes it. And the most likely is equal eight. And this the, the nuclear energy generation rate is the maximum possible value. You could even have Z equal 10 that could contribute. No? So that, that's a range of possibility. Another possi thing that could, could happen is that the element could just burn before they reach density. So here I calculate the lifetime. And since it takes about a thousand years to act for the matter to be pushed to the density, I, I look at where the lifetime of the element would be 1,000 years. So it's, it's the first naive intent. And, and that gives me this value, no? again, depending on the density, on the mass fraction of the elements. No? So I see that in all, all cases, this curve here for the explosion are at lower densities than the exhaustion point. No? So, so, so it looks like reasonable that this light element will survive and can reach this high density where they will explode. No? No, one, one, one more slide. To, to discuss how, how do I calculate this epsilon cool. Epsilon nuke is very easy to calculate because epsilon nuke depends on the, on the chemical composition and the temperature. I take the formula for epsilon nuke and the derivative with respect to T. I mean, it's, it's a local quantity. So it is actually just uh, the, the analytical derivative of epsilon with respect to T. The cooling is much more tricky because actually this, this cooling rate is a derivative of the flux inside the star. Mm -hmm. 
So it is derivative with respect to y, y dy is just a row times dr, so, so that it gets the same unit as epsilon nuclear. But this guy is the first derivative, and then, I mean, the flux is a derivative of the temperature, so this is the second derivative. So let me look at this. And uh, so yeah, so the, the cooling rate is, is the derivative of the flux, which itself is the derivative of the temperature, so it's a second derivative. So it's non-local, it's actually dependent on the full temperature profile in the star. So it's not a naive temperature derivation, it's actually like a functional derivative. I have to modify the temperature profile and calculate the derivative of epsilon cool with this temperature profile. So, so you can do anything you want, so, but you have to do something reasonable. Actually, my first calculation was completely ignorant and I got it wrong by four orders of magnitude. Then I realized that it was wrong and people start criticizing me. And I think I've done a little bit better. And I found this was discussed pretty carefully in a paper by, by Sasha Potehim with Gilles Chavarier almost, well, 10 years ago. I was 10 years late again. So, so some shows, for example, you, you could choose to change the temperature profile just constant. You just add some temperature everywhere in the profile. So you're going to change the cooling rate and you can calculate the epsilon cool dt. People in X-ray birds have been doing one zone approximation. So simply, instead of taking a derivative with respect to Y or with respect to R, they just divide by Y. So they find that epsilon cool is just KT over rho Y squared. Or you can do a scale height approximation. You can uh, replace a derivative with respect to R just by X over some delta R. So if the X is the pressure, you get a pressure scale height. If the X is a temperature, you get a temperature scale height. So you, you can calculate this derivative by different methods. And it, it turns out they all give the same results. Within the factor of a few, you, you get the same result. And uh, so now I have calculated it more, more accurately. Let me show you something interesting. That, that was my, sometimes we say an educated guess. So this was an uneducated guess. I, I just got completely wrong and estimated that epsilon cool dt was 10 to the two. And now using these three different method, which seemed more appropriate, I found that it's more like than 10 to the minus two. So this would be my previous figure, that's the one that is on the paper in the archive, where I find 10 to the plus two, and that the same figure with 10 to the minus two. So, so I recalculate the curve, and they, they, they move a little bit, but not significantly. Why does it move significantly? But even if I change this by four orders of magnitude, the nuclear rate are so enormously temperature dependent and density dependent that all these curves shift a little bit. The conclusion is the same, no? except this one, for example, shift a bit to the left. So I would favor all of these more strongly is equal 10, while here it was kind of difficult. No? And with the wrong rate, I could say, well, maybe the minimum rate, it could be carbon. Now with the correct, well, let's say a right estimate of epsilon cool carbon is excluded. But basically it remains the same. It, it, it should have been z equal eight or 10. And that's it. Well, the last question, the whole frequent of this hyperburst. So some simple estimates, the occurred density of 10 to the 11 gram per cubic centimeter. So the column density of 10 to the 15 gram per cubic per square centimeter. This guy was accreting most of the time at Eddington rate. So Eddington rate is 10 to the five gram per square centimeter per second. So it takes off the order of 300 years to accrete a layer of 10 to the 15. Now to, to detect the hyperburst, we need a star that is not accreting all the time because you, you want to see the cooling after the accretion. So you want an accretion rate that the average accretion rate is going to be lower than the Eddington rate. No? This maxi source has been accreted almost like 20, 25% of the time. No? And it's accreting mostly at Eddington rate. So it's average, at least in the last 10 years, is one quarter of Eddington. So the recurrence time, which means the time it takes to push the matter to 10 to 11 gram per cubic centimeter is about a thousand years. No? And if the average rate a longer time over the last, 10, 000, the last thousand years was even smaller, so it probably took a few thousand years. So that, that the point, it, even for strongly accreting neutron star, we could expect one hyperburst every few millennia. 
And so given the small number of sources we have, we could say that uh, we, we should see one such outburst every three centuries. So basically the prediction of the model that we've seen once and we we'll never see it again. So at least we can prove this wrong. If we see another hyperburst in that source, that will be the end of it. No? And it, it shows a, a burst, I mean, a Christian burst every three to four years. So if we get an, a new burst in the near future and it comes out extremely hot, like 300 kV, 300 EV, sorry, as it was seen, uh, that will rule out the model. No? If we never see it again, then the model will be correct. So I think I spent a lot of time. Let me go to my conclusion. Okay, so the good point, we, we can model more than 10 years of accretion history of this maxi source with a single parameter resolution of the shallow heating. So it indicates that maybe shallow heating could be understandable in the near future. It's not widely changing from one old burst to the other, at least in this source, maxi, and also in the source MXB. The counter example is Aquila X1, when the shadow heating shine from one old burst to the other. So we have to figure out what's happening in Aquila, if there's something different than what's happening in these two sources. And uh, the extremely hot, high temperature of Maxi after its hot old burst can be explained by this thermal nuclear explosion with this property, and it's very likely explosion from oxygen, D equal eight, or neon. Uh, with e equal 10. Mm. And, but the ignition conclusion uh, conditions are close to the peak non-nuclear regime. Mm. And, and the bad thing is that the time to build this layer to explore this of the order of a millennium, so they are extremely rare events. And there, there are some, terminated with something funny that uh, an author from the New Scientist sees the paper immediately, he likes the work hyperburst and he wrote something. And he, he wrote something that is interesting in saying, how can you prove the theory? That the only way to prove it is to never see it again. No? <laughs> so maybe we're setting new standard for scientific validation. No? Something that will never happen again is the proof that it is correct. But it's, it's a proof, it's not, it's an anti-proof, it is not incorrect, let's say. That's it. So I, I'm sorry. I oh god, I talked uh, for an hour and a half. <laughs> thank you very much, Danny. Well, uh, please uh, ask questions. May I ask a question? Perhaps two. Well, the first question is: If you can take your burning layer and move the low density boundary of the, of the burning layer to the density up to 10 to the 10 gram per centimeter cubic. I mm. would say that you will obtain absolutely the same results because oh. these low densities are, are important in this picture. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that if, if you take only the very high density, yeah. I mean, this is the energy per gram. So most of the energy come at the high density. And in a few days, then the the, yeah. the heat really is at high density would diffuse to low density. Yeah. I think the, the low density is completely relevant. It's it's only the high density part, yes. I haven't tried it, but but you're right, it it, it probably doesn't make a difference. It is very easy to check. Not yes. a problem. Yes, it's not a problem. Mm. Yeah. And the second question, may I ask the second question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, what do you think? Can anything like that can occur in very massive white dwarfs? I don't know. I never thought about it, but 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 can, can they get that hot? Yeah. You if can that, know the name. Okay, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, if well, there are any questions, please. No questions. Everyone is shocked <laughs> that we <laughs> will never see it again. 
Mm -hmm. never... May I ask you a question? Uh, of course. This is related. Uh, this is related to what uh, Michael uh, said a while back. Mm -hmm. If the actual uh, deep crustal heating is 0.2 instead of two, will this work? You see, there is an interesting question that Rudy Weinen asked when we started having the shallow heating that can be stronger than the deep crustal heating. And observers always have this nasty question. So, so they say, and what if we forget shallow heating? Can we just do it? See, if we forget deep crustal heating, assume it's zero and you only use the shallow heating. And I thought, well, that's a stupid observer question. So I'm not going to answer it. But uh, I have a feeling that we could do it, maybe. Huh? Some, something could work. And, and the long term, no. I mean, when, when you see what's happening, uh, in the case of Maxi, it never relaxes. It, it gets a new accretion burst before it can really cool down. No? But the source is KS17 something on MSB 1659, when we have seen the full cooling for several years and then it flattened. I think the end of the cooling phase, no, but after three, four, five years of accretion, I think th this would be difficult if you don't have the deep crustal heating. No? But uh, where we have, well, that is that one simply, okay. Well, th this is only one year. Uh, which one? K KS had, had a stronger. Well, anyway, here we have several of these quotes. Well, what's happening here after two or three years? No? So with, if the, sh the deep cross thing is very low, maybe you have trouble here, no? But maybe not, no? The data are also lousy because the star is so cold that you get very few photons. The aerobars are pretty big. So, but, 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 but not, nobody had tried it, no? So we sh we sh it's something to be done, yeah? And I know you have uh, some theoretical motivation that the, shallow, the deep crustal eating could be very small, actually. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are you satisfied? Yes, uh, thank you. In fact, uh, I uh, tried, I played a bit uh, with this model with uh, diminished uh, deep crustal heating, and uh, this leads to uh, too uh, short relaxation time, too short uh, crustal cooling time. Uh -huh. uh, unless we introduce artificially uh, too much, uh, well, very, very strong impurity parameters or something like, like that. Okay. So, mm -hmm. one, one can, uh, can uh, try to fit that, but uh, at the cost of additional, additional theoretical ingredients. <laughs> But uh, you still need shallow heating, right? Yes. So yes. you can uh, deposit shallow of, heating of, of course, deeper. Yes, yes. yes. In, in that case, the shallow heating plays even a bigger uh, role yes. mm -hmm. without, than, than, it's, uh, than in the Hansel Dunick model. Yeah, yeah. But it's always bad. I mean, shallow heating is still like black magic so far. Huh? Yeah. Yes. So, so, maybe the first, so maybe this first argument that the, the crust is a crystal is wrong. Maybe there is very little deep crustal heating and actually the crust is extremely impure. Uh, no, but uh, here it doesn't matter. You uh, hit the crust by some source, and then it cools. And the time scale of this cooling, you, so you cannot deposit heat only now to crust because uh, otherwise you will not get these older part. That's why these uh, yeah you the conclusions by Brown and Cummings. So he, for the conductivity, I believe that the actual sort of distribution is of less importance. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even if you if you deposit a lot of energy at low density to reproduce the cooling curve, this energy has to go to high density. No? Right. 
So if the conductivity if the conductivity is very low, then the heat does not go diffuse to high density, and you don't feel the cooling curve. Yeah, yeah you will have the sharp uh, first that, that, time that, cooling, okay. and then so okay, probably so. So, so there's something wrong in the model that the shallow heating at high density is weak. There is something else that deposit energy is there, hmm? or everything is wrong. That that's possible. Anyway, there is some uh, so, some field to investigate. Yeah. <laughs> More questions? And can, can we return to the condition uh, of explosive burning uh, in in the last ne ne somewhere near the end? Yeah. Yes. Which which one do you mean? Uh, yeah, this mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. This okay. So, yeah. So this condition is is a local one. Yes. So it's it defines yeah. the the point where the explosion starts. Yeah. Yes, it, it is a local one. Yeah, even this epsilon, the epsilon coolant is not local, no. But this one is definitely local. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, yeah. I, I mean this one. So at at some point, uh, it uh, for example, uh, the explosion will start, but yeah. epsilon nuclear is str strongly depends on density. So in the in a, in the neighborhood of of this point, it will it could be uh, not energetically favorable to to explode. So there will be an interplay between thermal conduct conduction, neutrino emission, and and uh, uh, the dependence of epsilon nuclear on density and temperature. Yes, so, yes. And mm -hmm. both of these effects, both these effects should be taken into account simultaneously. So for me, it's not obvious that such a simple condition will guarantee that the, the whole layer from 10 to the 11 up to 10 to the 9, for example, or 8, gram per cubic centimeters will will explode it will explode i agree yeah yeah but what but consider when you start exploding at some point the temperature will get very high i mean here i show the temperature profile by, by depositing all the energy instantaneously mm -hmm. so at high density so if you look at very short time scale where there's no heat transport then the temperature went up to a few times 10 to the 9 kelvin mm -hmm. But but note that note that the real time scale will be much larger than uh, two hundred seconds, as you assumed. Even local time scale will be much larger. And uh, the temperature no. ten to the nine. Do do you take into account neutrino emission from from this from this re region, for example? Yes, 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 yes. I have neutrino emission. Yes, absolutely. That that would bring it down from from here to to there in one day. Because in this in this criterion, in principle, there should be also a neutrino emission term. Yeah, for the ignition term, the neutrino emission is about four four orders of magnitude smaller. Okay, so it, it is negligible. Yes, yes, I've checked it. Yeah, yeah, but but I am a little bit worried that uh, epsilon nuclear will 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 depend on density, also very in a very strong fashion, and this could affect the the overall yeah. overall stability of the of the yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. no i agree i mean this this model is extremely simple simplified and primitive no? but that what people do so i say okay since i'm not an expert on that i'm going to do the simple thing see if it works and then people will start criticizing and and do it better mm -hmm. yeah. i mean but, but it's, 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 it's really easy to check to check by direct calculation i i, I believe I'm, I'm yeah, sure by modeling that. the hyperbars. Well, but I would have to deposit energy only in one point. But 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 the point that it becomes very hot and then it propagate. I don't know. I could do it. Actually, one of the experts in propagation of the flame at the surface of the burst is also at UNAM. It's Yuri Kaveki, and it's extremely complicated and messy huh? mm -hmm. to see how the flame propagates. Because what, when you start exploding at one point, the temperature will go well above ten to the nine Kelvin in that point. You can it's imagine, like obvious. if if it if it if this deposition of energy occurs uh, rather slowly, then it's not obvious that the temperature will be so, so, such high, so high you, as, as you assume. Okay. Yeah. So so you you mean yeah. Okay. So the, the next step is to do really solve the equation 
of the nuclear burning, not, not on a real time scale, not not two hundred seconds, but on a real time scale. And we, yeah, just deposit the energy. Yeah, actually, it, it should explode because the temperature is going is increasing with time. No? If I show this temperature profile, well, here, no, that one, okay. This is the temperature of the exploding layer. So it goes up and up and very slowly, but it goes up. So obviously, if I put into the model the nuclear reaction rate all the time, when it goes above the critical point, it should explode but naturally by itself. I don't have to perturbate it. It's it just because it goes too hot and then it should explode by itself here. Yeah. So that, that's a good point. Yeah, that, that's something we should do. Mm -hmm. We're actually implementing at low density, but once we have it at low density, it, it's easy to do it there. Hmm? Okay. okay, more questions? Comments? Remarks? Okay, so the effort. I is have a question. Uh, yes. I'm better in English. But I try uh, to explain my question. On uh, 14 slide, uh, you told uh, that our gravitational energy liberated and radiated away 50% uh, here. Uh, I don't understand this uh, voice, why our gravitational energy is uh, emerging. Can you please well, uh, repeat? Or, uh, yeah, okay. Let's say it, it is a student. He probably do, do not know how it's happened. No, but it's a good question because it, it may be partially wrong. I mean, the, the point you, you have this energy when the matter hits the surface, it, it I mean, it, it liberates about it, it has a kinetic energy of the order of, let's say, 100 MeV for each proton that hits the, the surface of the neutron star. So the naive way of doing it is this, this kinetic energy will be trans, trans, transformed into heat. And we see that the surface of the neutron star has a temperature of the order of, of 20 million Kelvin. And, but but the, the deeper into the star, the matter is hotter than this. So this heat liberated at the surface have to go out. It cannot move inside the star. You cannot move heat from the cold part to the hot part. No? So if the gravitational energy, which is kinetic energy, is transformed into heat, it's radiated away. But part of it could, could be transformed in something else. If you take in, there is a model by uh, Inogamov and Sunyahev, but they find that a lot of energy could be kept at, actually in terms of kinetic energy because the, rotation, the matter is rotating very fast. The accretion disk is rotating much faster than neutron star. So when the matter hits the surface of the neutron star, it has a velocity tangent to the surface that is very high. So you have to slow down the matter. And uh, so part of this energy could produce waves. I, I, I never read the papers, but, but they, they claim that you could generate waves and you can, some part of this gravitational energy, instead of being transformed into heat, could be moved to higher density. And that could be the source of the shallow heating. So this shallow heating could be gravitational energy. So you were perfectly right. It doesn't have to be, but it has to be converted in something that is not heat. No? It has to be moved in water through waves. And then at some point the wave dissipate and liberate energy deeper. Okay, I understand now. Thank you. Okay. So this slide is very sloppy. I mean, almost everything I'm doing is very sloppy. I'm sorry. But this, this was another sloppy part. Okay, uh, uh, more questions? May I ask a naive question? Of course. Uh, about how the thermonuclear burst propagate if it start at high density and propagate outward. Uh, is it front of this thermonuclear burning is propagating supersonically or uh, subsonically? Is it known something about that? I, I, no, I, I think the normal burst, it is subsonic. Subsonic. It's, pro 
because yeah. even if, if it's supersonic, if it probably shouldn't depend on, say, on, con on con con conductivity. No, then it gives it the shock wave and it goes extremely but fast. If it's subsonic, it probably can depend. Thank you. But according to people who do X-ray burst and they do frame propagation at the surface, of course, at very low density. When I say that this is occurring at very much higher densities, they say that it's going to propagate much faster. So if it takes a few milliseconds for a normal X-ray burst for the explosion to propagate on the full surface, when it's very deep, it, it could be also a few milliseconds. Unless the problem will be since we're close to the peak of nuclear, uh, maybe the energy generation goes up very slowly and it doesn't propagate that fast. No? So, but it's totally unexplored, huh? and honestly. It's, I would say, not even an educated guess. It's just a, a, a wild guess. No? Yeah. So, other questions? Well, if not, uh, then let us thank Professor Parsh again with the hope uh, to see and meet him again. Well, in spite of moon predictions that nothing will be happening again, Okay, Dania, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. So the seminar is over. The next seminar will be the next Tuesday, our standard time, and uh, Vasily Domus will present his PhD thesis. Um, well, he will discuss, we will discuss his PhD results, and that's all. So thank, thank you, you very you. much, and thank goodbye. You. Nice to see you. Yeah, yeah Xenia. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I wish I can come physically to St. Petersburg. It was very interesting. Thank you very much. Pretty soon. Well, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the question. And thank you for emphasizing that I have to read your papers about the, the deep crustal heating, definitely. I promised a few weeks ago at the GINA NT uh, workshop that I will read these papers and uh, I didn't keep my promise, but I hope next time I will have read it and should incorporate this in the model. Yeah. I, actually, I, I, may, I, I would like to have a question with Sasha Potehim. I don't know, maybe you can say, or can I ask it once? You can ask, but I do not see Sasha. He left, he was here. Uh, yeah, he disconnected. Uh, Okay, well, so I, I write to him. Okay. Then we, we can call to him if you wish. Well, I, I can write to him. It's okay. I thought he was here. I could ask him, but because he, he had a very interesting paper, Chris, about the, the burning condition when I calculated this here. That's why I mentioned Potahin and Chabrier. They have a different way to calculate this uh, explosion criterion, but I, I couldn't understand from the paper what they do exactly. But the point was, it was essentially getting the same result again. So they had a four way of calculating this, and it gives the same result from what I understood. Anyway, so I, I just write to him and ask him the question. Okay. Okay, then. Thank okay. you very much. And thank you very much for the invitation. up so early. It's not so early. It was 9 a.m. in Mexico, so it's, it's a good time. Okay. Okay, so let's keep in touch and hope to, to meet physically somewhere in the near future. I hope, yeah. And it was a pleasure to, to be with you. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Xenia. Goodbye to everybody. Goodbye, Denny. Goodbye. Okay.